focus. Ideate. Innovate. Enable. Cyril Amarchand Mangaldas presents CNBC TV 18, The Thought Lead, Season 2. Hello and welcome to yet another episode of uh, the Thought League and today we are going to discuss the very importance of the way we have seen the insolvency and bankruptcy cases in India and the entire process. So we are going to analyze the insolvency law in India in the post-pandemic world and how has it fared in the last five years of existence. Let me welcome on the show to discuss this very important topic we have with us James uh, Spray Reagan who is the founder at Kirkland and Alice Worldwide Restructuring Group joining us straight from Chicago and uh, Cyril Amarchand Mangaldas, Cyril Shroff. Gentlemen, so good to have you on CNBC TV 18. My first question to you, Cyril Shroff, you have been working tirelessly on the IBC process. We have evolved a lot, businesses have evolved a lot and the very IBC has uh, become a lot more mature. How do you assess the entire progress? So Nisha, this is a very timely conversation. Uh, it is five years, December 2021 represents five years since uh, the IBC uh, became law. And if I were to step back and take a, uh, you know, take stock of the five years that have gone by, I think it would be a mixed bag. Uh, we had several early successes because what uh, IBC originally did was it changed the paradigm completely. It rebalanced the power between creditor and uh, and debtor, and we had some tremendous early successes, including the SR Steel case. Uh, the Bhushan cases uh, and several others, which uh, kind of really left their mark. Uh, but since then, things have slowed down. So uh, philosophically, what IBC did was it really created an entirely new, uh, you know, a market for corporate control through the debt route. Uh, it, uh, it it provided a, an avenue for really for the, the the lenders and the banking sector to effectively take a different approach to uh, recovery and restructuring. Now, what happened subsequent towards the end, even before the pandemic, was that some of the institutional failures started coming to the fore, including capacity constraints at uh, the NCLT and several others, which we will talk about. But the pandemic really threw a spanner in the works. Mm -hmm. And a few themes, uh, themes emerged, which we'll talk about. Uh, the process versus value conversation, creditor control versus debtor control, uh, 29A, um, and you know several of these ma major topics kind of came up which we'll talk about. So as I take stock today, uh, IBC initial successes currently uh, kind of in a ditch at the moment, and we have to figure out how to kind of get out of this ditch. That's right. Uh, so get out of the ditch. But how does uh, the global participants and global experts on this really uh, view this particular situation in India? James, uh, you've been an expert globally, sitting from outside India, but also knowing the Indian IBC very well. How do you assess it uh, and benchmark it to the other uh, important developing markets as well as developed countries? Yes, thank you for having me. Um, I would say uh, I agree with the comments uh, that uh, Cyril just made, uh, but I'd probably step back a little bit further. Five years is kind of a blink of an eye uh, for assessing uh, how a new insolvency system is going to work, especially one as ambitious as the IBC. When I look at, for example, uh, when you say other developed countries, that the United States system we put in in 1978, so it's been 40, 45 years, we've amended our our um, our own new insolvency system from 1978 several hundred times literally since then to tinker with it and try to get it right so it may need to get out of the ditch now but five years is what i would say still early days and there's a lot of time to uh, continue to try to fix it when i assess it against other developing uh, country systems i think it's a very forward-looking system it's got some warts and things that need to be fixed um, but I think it's a very good start uh, benchmarked against, uh, say, the U.S. system, the U.K. system and other developing countries. 
All right. Uh, so, positive note, uh, of course, it's still at a nascent stage, only five years, while U.S. has seen several years of evolution on the IBC front. So, Cyril Shroff, now the requirement of IBC could be much larger in the post-pandemic world. How do you see the dynamics change and the need for it at this point? So, we had uh, one year of suspension of the IBC from March 2020 till March 2021. And uh, logically, once the suspension came to an end, you know, on 26th or 27th of March 2021, we should have seen an avalanche of uh, filings uh, before the NCLD, but that did not happen. So I think it triggers a question in our minds of why did that not happen? Uh, and, you know, it's, it's not as if the insolvencies have reduced. If at all, there have been many more that have got added uh, because uh, of uh, the effect of the pandemic. But why did the floodgates not open? And I think that forces us to think about a little bit about the structure of how the system works and a need to kind of reimagine uh, IBC 2.0. Two or three uh, high-level thoughts on this. I think it might be worthwhile reimagining the uh, you know debtor in uh, the creditor in control versus the debtor in control model a bit or to tweak it secondly i think we seriously need to reimagine section 29a because section 29a really knocks out of the race in many situations probably the only buyer who is uh, interested uh, you know in the uh, in the asset and you have artificially tied yourself not to allow like free competition with the most likely and the most enthusiastic party uh, to play. Uh, then I think we also need to reimagine, uh, you know, other forms of restructuring. For example, today most of the restructurings are really about resulting in an M&A transaction where the assets are sold. But that's a very narrow view of uh, uh, of, of resolution. Resolution can involve restructuring of the balance sheet, recapitalization, all sorts of things. And if you allow the promoter to play, I think all of those options will come to the table as well. And until we do that, I don't think we are going to see uh, the, the, the next phase of, uh, uh, of the evolution of IBC really come in. Another thought uh, which I would like to put on the table is how we look at the financial sector. So after RBI made the changes uh, in the context of DHFL and brought in the uh, financial sector into IBC, I think we had some initial successes. But you know, going forward, some other big ones coming into the picture, uh, I think we need to th rethink about whether we need a special law for uh, the financial sector or whether we kind of just bolt on uh, IBC onto uh, onto the, the the financial sector resolution as well because financial sector the structure is very very different. Yes. So uh, as we get into the next phase, many new issues. Uh, what we currently have is not going to work. Right. Uh, we have been uh, looking at expanding the scope as you rightly mentioned, but one very important point that Cyril Shroff has really touched upon is the recovery versus resolution metrics of success of uh, the, these processes. Um, James, what is your view on that? And have we seen many successes uh, in the US on even resolutions? And um, where does India stand in this according to you? And where can it go in the post pandemic world in particular? Yeah, I think uh, the comments before really are pointing out uh, some of the tensions in how to construct a uh, useful um, insolvency process. And what I mean by that is there's always a tension uh, between how much of the law should be uh, incredibly specific and leave the judge without discretion as to how to proceed uh, to give people confidence in the process. I always say substance or process is substance. Uh, but then, uh, you know, restructurings go a lot of different directions, and it's pretty hard to write a law that addresses specifically what's going to happen in a situation. So inevitably, you need to leave uh, a decent amount of discretion. But if you leave too much discretion, uh, that reduces the confidence in the system, and it looks like it's just a judge making up uh, rules. We, for example, do allow promoters, uh, you know, our version of promoters, uh, to uh, bid on assets that of companies that they take into bankruptcy. But uh, there's a lot of rules um, in the statute that go around that to try to make sure 
that it's a level playing field and fair to other bidders and that the promoters can't take unfair advantage of the process. I think it is correct if you just have outright bans in uh, certain um, constituents, particularly promoters, uh, uh, participating in the process, you end up with a, uh, a more uh, static system that might not allow uh, the resolution to actually occur in a constructive way and could cost jobs and could cause liquidations uh, or premature M&A processes uh, that don't really get the maximum value. All right. Uh, so, James, uh, we've uh, set the tone for what, uh, where our uh, insolvency laws really lie at the moment. But uh, it is definitely proven that in a post-pandemic world, this could really act as a silver bullet. We'll take a short break on that note and we'll come back and discuss more about the evolution and the importance and the growing prominence of insolvency laws in India going forward. Take a break and be back on The Thought Leak. Cyril Amarchand Mangaldas presents CNBC TV 18, The Thought League, Season 2. Welcome back. You're watching The Thought League and we are discussing the insolvency laws and its importance in the post-pandemic world. James, you were making a lot of points about the processes. We spoke about the tension between resolution versus the recovery. What are some of the big changes that have come about when we look at this particular space in the post-pandemic world in your view? Uh, during the pandemic, really countries around the world uh, loosened up uh, many of their insolvency uh, rules that had uh, pushed companies uh, in prematurely into proceedings, uh, all different kinds and names uh, around the world, but in essence that had been causing uh, liquidations. Uh, and obviously there was a massive discomfort with that as the pandemic hit uh, because the, you know, when you uh, have no revenue because you had to shut down, it's, it's pretty hard to uh, cover your expenses. And so you saw the United States uh, loosened up a number of its rules. The uh, uh, UK did that, uh, Germany did that, Australia did that, a number of company, uh, countries in Latin America did that, all with the goal of promoting recovery. Uh, and many of these rules were temporary, but um, from my conversations uh, uh, with a number of people around the world, I think people have seen that there's actually been a number of constructive developments that should survive uh, the uh, the pandemic and be part of the post-pandemic world because you know in the world of recovery, uh, what I what I say is you need to build not just the statutes but you need to build the rescue culture, and the rescue culture has to do with the ecosystem of the professionals that surround uh, a restructuring situation and help nurture the company back to health. Obviously, all in the context of whatever the statutory system is. But if you have a constructive statutory system that allows for the reorganization, and then you have uh, competent professionals uh, knowing the rules of the road, uh, you can save a lot of jobs and have a lot uh, more recovery for the creditors uh, and uh, have a, a better system. Right. So you said that some of the emergency measures have been taken by other economies, but they have been temporary in nature. We have to see for how long do we require it, considering that the COVID uncertainties still um, lie ahead of us at the moment. Cyril Shroff, what are the key factors that we need to look at uh, when it comes to the Indian insolvency going forward, as it is important right now. But in the past, I also want to attract your attention to one aspect, which is that we've taken two steps forward and one st step back also because of the overall process being too frustrating for especially the global players. So multiple questions, but uh, let me first take the uh, you know, initial part of your question on what uh, what we need to do. So first, let me start with mindset. Uh, I, I think that the mindset is a big part of where the problem lies because we tend to think about uh, you know success as uh, an expression of a lower level of haircut. If you've taken a haircut of uh, uh, less than fifty percent, it's a successful case. If your haircut is more than fifty percent, it's a failure. I think we need to get out of this binary way of uh, of thinking because. I think that is really doing injustice to what the true purpose of IBC was meant to be. Uh, and, and I think that will shape a lot of, uh, you know, how the policies uh, evolve around this. The second mindset thing, I think, is that we need to, should stop getting obsessed 
with value versus process as if these two were mutually exclusive because the final aim should be value maximization and whichever way you get there i think we should uh, uh, we should be open minded about this you know i remember once in a at a conference uh, where james was the speaker and he was telling me about uh, uh, some of the international uh, rules and he said there's only one rule that there are no rules uh and i think we should keep uh, uh, keep thinking about that as what it really means in terms of keeping a mindset of finding resolution and maximizing value as opposed to being stuck on some of our own creations yeah. from the problems that we have laid through the web of uh, regulation now let me come to something more structural i think there are three or four things which clearly stand out firstly the nclt regime needs to be strengthened immensely Yes, we have made a few recent appointments, but compared to the size of the problem, I think you know it's a drop in the ocean. That's one. Secondly, the information systems, and this is where your point about foreign bidders comes in as well. A foreign bidder, somebody from either Singapore or Hong Kong or the US who wants to participate uh, uh, in a process, has no reliable information, and consequently, always at a disadvantage compared to a local player. who may have a lot of informal systems through which they get access to what the real issue is so that's the second and i think the third uh, is the role of the state as a litigant mm. what we have seen in um, you know many insolvencies is that whether it's the ed or the tax department or you know some state uh, a state actor uh, is the biggest litigant and creates the biggest risk in relation to a resolution it is impossible to price that risk in the uh, in the bid and consequently uh, you know it throws a spanner in the works of finding a resolution there has to be a way through by which the legislation or the policy environment can rein in the uh, the state and its various myriad forms so that we can what can be transferred is a clean asset uh, and this is very difficult and we know that case after case this is the biggest problem All right. So some of those uh, need uh, some solutions. But James, uh, one question that I asked Cyril Shroff, and I'll throw it to you: How is India viewed when it comes to the global uh, investors trying to maneuver their way into the insolvency process? It has been frustrating for many. Is that the perception outside? Well, I would say that uh, global capital deploys itself. uh in a way where they look for the least risk and the greatest return and i think when the ibc first came in uh there was a great deal of excitement uh and buzz uh from a lot of global uh distressed investors and they thought it might be the the new gold rush uh and you had a lot of the different uh uh hedge funds and other uh capital allocators um deploying uh human resources to india with the hope of actually deploying a lot of capital uh as mentioned it really unfortunately hasn't turned out that way uh because there uh i would say it's very much a work in process and the ardor has cooled uh to a decent extent uh because there is frustration uh amongst the um hong kong singapore us players that they spend a lot of time and money uh and uh ultimately have not really been able to succeed that much in deploying their capital uh and uh as a result they've uh, a number of them seeing opportunities in other countries uh and opportunities to deploy the capital uh with less time and more efficiency have gone and done that i i do think uh um uh, uh we shouldn't beat ourselves up too much about that because some of the complaints that i hear about trying to deploy uh global capital in india if uh, i'm honest with even the us system where i think we have a pretty good system it's pretty developed and the rule of law applies we still have a lot of the t- the same types of issues that we need to manage uh so i do think it's very much a work in process all right and very quickly uh, uh james some of the hybrid and the new structures which have really worked uh, in uh, combating the insolvency problems of some of the companies any recent successes we can learn from Yeah, I'll give you an example. For example, we have a very large uh, retailer in the United States called JC Penney, uh over 60,000 jobs. Uh and that uh went into an insolvency proceeding um a few months after COVID hit. Uh now the history of uh retailers going into insolvency proceedings in the US for the couple of years preceding that was a very sorry history. Uh most of those retailers like if you've heard of Toys R Us liquidated tens of thousands of jobs were lost and 
many empty stores and the like. And that was the prediction of what was going to happen with J.C. JCPenney. Uh, we, uh, my firm, had the uh, opportunity to help represent the company there. Uh, we had a mediation proceeding with a sitting bankruptcy judge who was not the judge on the case. Uh, we had uh, outside investors come in. We had the uh, creditors who were already at the table, uh, also part of it. And there was uh, a bunch of new capital put in. Uh, there was a conversion of debt to equity. Uh, there was a slimming down of the enterprise, uh, but not a wholesale closure. Some jobs were lost, but in the main, it was able to reorganize and probably 50,000 jobs were saved. Yeah. So I would chalk that up as a pretty good pandemic success. That's right. And saving jobs in any such situation uh, is of prime importance and that can clearly be a success. Now, listening to uh, the various success stories and the different kind of structures, Cyril Shroff, um, I would like to highlight one uh, uh, particular point here. And you mentioned a lot of changes that are required. But don't you think that there needs to be more innovative structures where an investment banker and deal maker yours, or like yourself can really play an important role in any resolution in these cases uh, where the bankers as well as the lenders may not be fully uh, really educated about creating those structures for the right resolution? Absolutely, uh, Anisha. And I think, uh, to be fair, I think that's how it is working as well. Uh, yes, you need to come to this with an M&A mindset uh, because many of these will, re whether it's a restructuring or a re uh, you know, re restructuring result in a sale of the assets, whatever it is, you need to come with a you know M and A mindset and kind of the uh, you know investment banker background and insolvency court background and innovation. So I mean, you need a very versatile toolkit. Uh, to deal with this. And, you know, some of my earlier observations on the way the system has evolved in the last five years, it's a very narrow toolkit. And uh, I'm hoping that as the law evolves uh, in its next, uh, next avatar, that the toolkit expands uh, significantly with some of the things that we have spoken about, you know, deleting 29A, allowing for more, uh, you know, uh, uh, forms of uh, restructuring, all of that. That will make the game very interesting and actually will result in more recovery. You also have a new bad bank around the corner. The, the NARCL uh, has come on the pitch and they're going to know, need all these tools. That's right. So on that note, uh, Cyril Shroff as well as uh, James Pre Reagan, thanks so much for joining us with all the insights. And it is coming out very clearly. And the House is quite united in the view that um, in the post-pandemic world, IBC will play a very important role in India, but in a much more evolved and diversified fashion. With that, it's a wrap on this edition of The Thought League. Thanks so much for tuning in. Cyril Amarchand Mangaldas presents CNBC TV 18, The Thought League, Season 2. Focus. Ideate. Innovate. Enable.